All right, so here we are. This is 128, hacking mobile devices. Let me check, yep, Monday, we're right, okay. So what I'm gonna do today is talk about uh, the first part of chapter seven, attacking Android applications, and demo these projects, and uh, warn you, that's gonna take us through all the projects that are due for a while. Um, 501 is the one most directly relevant to what we're talking about today, but don't do it yet. I'm gonna have to greatly revise this project, which I'm gonna explain. Um, all right, so let's start here. Let me get this to the right part of the screen because only part of my screen is being streamed. Okay, that should do it. So I split this chapter into three pieces as before, so we're gonna talk about the security model and begin attacking components, and then we'll have more topics in later lectures. So there's three general components involved when you run an app. There's the app itself, which runs in a sort of security sandbox on the phone. Then it sends communications over your Wi-Fi, typically, to get to the internet, and then there's a server at the other end. And you can attack any of these parts of this. So if you attack the application container, this is mainly what we're gonna do, uh, ways to defeat the sandbox. If you can get to the data on the device by coming in from another app or some, from a malicious app is one way to do it. If you steal the phone, you can then try to copy the data off the device with forensic tools and techniques. And you might find other vulnerabilities in the app that let you do things you shouldn't be able to do, like bypass a password in the app or get to places you're not supposed to get in without logging in. The communications, of course, are typically going over your Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi is notoriously insecure in various ways. There's many ways to put yourself in a so-called privileged position, also called a man-in-the-middle attack, where you intercept all the traffic, and if it's not encrypted, you can read it and modify it. If it's encrypted, that's another barrier you'd have to get around. Art poisoning is a way to put yourself in the middle when you're just a client on a network. You can also just um, host a wireless network with a router under your control and then the router's in the middle and you control it. Or you could compromise internet service providers or other, um, anywhere on this chain, you could get yourself in the middle of the traffic and uh, then you might be able to do some attacks. Although if everybody's using correctly verified HTTPS, then it will be difficult to do anything because all the traffic will be encrypted with a key that you don't have. And of course, the server is often the weakest spot, as we talked about at the beginning of the class. If you just hack into the server at the other end, then of course you can manipulate the accounts there and manipulate the data coming in from the app. And uh, there's a ton of these. One of the things I hear a lot about is injecting JavaScript on servers, which then put, I think, Magento uh, connect to payment terminals in websites. And I think the same thing would be true of mobile devices. So they add uh, JavaScript and compromise the mobile device from the server end. So, the security model. Um, your Android apps have four components. There are activities, which are what you can see, the pages that open up that you can see. There are receivers, which receive um, intense signals from other devices on the app. There are services, which provide, uh, like Windows services, they run and provide some kind of service that the app can get. And there are content providers, which are databases that the app can query. And in very early versions of Android, all content providers were exported by, by default, which means they were available to every app on the device. Now, everything is not exported by default, which is far more sensible. So everything, every one of these components that your app uses is restricted for use only by that one app unless you intentionally decide to broadcast that information. And this target SDK version is a component you'll find in the manifest file of the device. I think it's in the manifest. And it determines... Um, what uh, the default publishing of the component, which in version of the Android SDK, which is a smaller, uh, more, more detailed version number of Android that you expected it to go to. There's the compile version, which is the one you use to compile it, and the minimum SDK version means you, the app will not install on any SDK before that. Um, but this is the one that determines whether the components will be published. And by the way, you can see which Android versions are in use. This is from this week. So you can see now, uh, all versions of and before Android 5 are now down to less than 1%. But Android 5 and 6 and 7 are considerable use and all the ones higher than that, the latest one being 11, is only 30%. So um, that's the way it tends to be, which means phones are many years old, you know. Probably down here they're about five years old, but not too many are still running Android 4. All right, so you can export a component in the, um, 
manifest file, you can define a receiver with receiver and slash receiver, and up here you give it a name and you just determine whether it's going to be exported. And if it's exported, then it's available to other apps on the device. Now here, it defined a provider and did not say whether it was exported, and so that means it will be implicitly exported if it's targeted at a very old version of Android. And so that might easily fool a developer that isn't very careful. All right, that's, now by the way, here's another one. If you put in an intent filter, so here is a um, activity, and the activity has an intent filter, which means this page that you can see is gonna listen for signals called intents, sent from one app to another on the device, and it's gonna look for a certain pattern of data. So it's got a name and a cat action. This is what it's gonna do, a send action, when it receives a signal, and this is what it's gonna look like, image slash star. When it gets an intent with a data field with the word image in it, it's going to receive that. Now that is only possible if it's exported because you're looking for a signal from another app. So they don't bother to explicitly show that it's exported, but if you include an intent filter, then that component is automatically exported, which would only make sense. All right, so you can examine the manifest to see these. Now, um, I used to use a tool called Drozer, but Drozer has pretty much been abandoned. Drozer was made by LinkedIn, and LinkedIn got acquired, I think, by Microsoft, and the project seems to have been abandoned. And so um, I don't ever thought it was really necessary anyway. When I saw what Drozer would do over the years, it seemed to me like it really didn't do much. And you can do everything you need without Drozer. So let me just uh, demonstrate this. Android Studio has gotten much better in the last couple of years and replaces a lot of the functions that you used to have to use these other apps for. So here. I've got um, these various panes, and this central pane we haven't used much yet. This is where you would edit an app, and you can just drag an APK into this central pane, and that's what we're going to do. Um, here's a uh, deliberately vulnerable Android app called Civ, which is good for demonstrating how you can attack from one intent to another, and that's what was in Project 501, and it'll be in whatever replacement I create for that. So let me download this Civ app from GitHub. I'll just put that link here. And there it comes. I'll just put it in downloads. All right. So I have the APK. So I'm, this is really nice. This is static analysis, what we're doing here. I'm not running the uh, app. I'm just um, downloading it and putting the APK into Android Studio. So when you drag Civ and drop it here, it shows you the components in Civ. You don't need to download it and run the APK tool. And you can see you've got the meta inf here. And in there, you've got the certificate. What is this garbage? Uh, I'll say, OK, I don't care. Now, down here, I got the Android manifest. And if you click on that, it opens the Android manifest down here and just lets you see it. So this is pretty nice. You can just view the manifest and examine how this app works without having to unpack it or have a Linux machine or anything. You just do it right in your Android Studio, which is great. And I'm going to rewrite the projects to do things this way. So now we can look at what's inside this app. And um, I won't, don't know if anybody makes font bigger there, but it's probably big enough. So here you've got some permissions. Remember when you install the app, it will say this app wants to see your camera and your Wi-Fi and that. These are the permissions of this app, like internet. Um, more and more permissions. Then here's the SDK. Target SDK version is 17, which I think means things will be exported by default on this one. Um, all right, here's an activity. The file select activity and you can see that it is to export it is true. Here's another activity with just a number, the main login activity, uh, which does not look like it's exported. It doesn't have any exported tag, but it has an intent filter, so I guess it will be exported. The main splash page has uh, listens for main and launcher, which is how every app opens. You execute a launch activity when you click on the icon, and it looks for at something listening for this launch intent, and that's what launches the app. So this one is going to be published because it has an intent filter. Here's another activity called PWList, because this thing is a password manager, and we'll be hacking into it later. Another thing called Settings, Add Entry, some kind of short login, Welcome Activity, very much of those things. So those are the activities. And then we got Services, Auth Service and Crypto Service, and both of those are exported which is probably a mistake, really. There's no particular reason for the cryptography for the password manager to be exported to other apps. Here's the uh, content provider, database content provider, and file backup provider. 
and both of them are exported. Exported equals true and exported equals true. And that's it. It doesn't have any of those um, services, I think. Or it has it's some, one of these four components it does not have. Uh, let me get my slide again. It doesn't have, uh, it doesn't, I think, have a broadcast receiver. That's what it doesn't have. It doesn't have any broadcast receiver. All right, anyway, so that's very nice. That's a very handy way to see the APK file, which is not a plain text file. You can't easily open it. It's in some funny format, but Android Studio will just open it for you, and that's a very good way to analyze it. So, there's, we talked about it. There's an activity, there's services, and there's content providers in SIV, and it doesn't have the other thing, broadcast receivers. Um, all right. So, there are different users. Now, most apps run as A0 underscore and a number, the specific account just for that one app, but there are root and system accounts which are powerful enough to interact with other application components so they can get into the data owned by other apps, which is what they have to do because those are the accounts you use to install apps. And so uh, if you're not exported in the manifest, those parts of the component are private, but attackers with root footage can still get at them, just like they can get at their private data folders. All right. So the protection level, we talked about this before, on a custom app is signature. That's the best one. That would mean the only apps that can uh, interact with this app are ones with the same signature, therefore ones from the same manufacturer that were designed with the intention of interoperating with this app. Now, there is a trick that's pretty good, although it only works if you go back to old Androids before 5. Um, at this time, if an app declared a new um, permission, uh, uh, the name of a permission, then if a later app came in and redefined the same name, it would just leave the permission level at the way the previous app had set it. So when you install Skype, it will install some special Skype permission levels. And you could previously install a malicious app that just defines those levels with a less insecure version, and that would fool them. So they were, um, that was kind of nasty. And very reminds me of the uh, one where you can have two files with the same name in the same APK file, and it didn't pick it up. These are all just uh, fairly easy to understand coding mistakes. All right, so to attack the components, intents I've talked about, these are objects that send, it asks for a task to be performed on the phone, and you can, um, inside your app, you can call start activity for your app to launch an intent. You can send a broadcast intent to go to a broadcast receiver, Broadcast receivers are for apps that listen to handle a wide-ranging common activity like viewing an image or opening a web page. You can start a service and so on. Uh, the intents do not necessarily specify the type of component receiving them, although they can specify which component is going to receive them. So here, for example, you say pick a photo in some kind of app, and then it wants to show you the photo, so it launches your photo viewer, which will be whatever the default photo viewer is. And you could install a different app to be the photo viewer, and then you might see it in a different app. So here's how you start another activity via an intent. Intent is new intent this, and you start the activity I. So you define an intent, and it contains some data. All right, so you can have an explicit intent that states the component that must receive it. This is, of course, the most secure and precise way to do it. You do not go to that res intent resolution process where the OS will hunt for which app to use. It directly delivers it to the specified component. Now, that might be good for one app to call another app that is from the same company and working together. But, for example, in a case like this, you might not know what image viewer they have or care. You just want to show the image. So you would not want to use a specifically targeted one, or your app would fail if that whatever you're shooting for is not installed on that phone. All right, but implicit intents are the more common. You just say something like, play this MP3 using whatever player is available. If there's only one player, it will just use it. If there's more than one player, it will pop up a box asking the user, which app do you want to use to open this thing? So this one is the, in, is the intent that tells Android to display a web page. I want to show you this web page, so I start this activity, which just says, um, view, the action is view, and this is what you're viewing, and it's a thing that starts with HTTP. This is called the scheme, and so now it will send this signal, and now it will listen for the intent filters to see if anybody can handle that request. Now, the intent filters can specify all different things, the action, the data, or the category. You do have to uh, define the action. The scheme is what you usually use, the part before the colon, HTTPS, 
So any, and that's what you typically do is define a scheme, and anything with the right scheme is run by your app. This is what Skype did. They defined a new scheme called Skype colon for phone calls, and then any app could make a Skype call by just make, sending an intent to Skype. Um, you could also use the host portion of the URI, www.google.com. Um, you could use the port, which would be the port number. You could specify a particular port number for like web type requests. You could also use path or path prefix or path pattern, and those will just search through all the data for something. So you can have a path say anything that contains Google anywhere, something like that, if you want to. Well, that's not as common. And you can specify MIME types, which is if you have a multi-purpose internet mail extension, a file worth of data included. All right, um, so you can, now this is why we really don't need Drozier anymore, so I'm going to get eliminated from all the projects, because you never did need it. You can just do it with built-in Android commands. AM is the activity manager. So you can launch activities just by executing these commands. This um, ADB shell connects to the Android device. This is the AM command, and I can now start something, and this will start a view action. So, you know, you can, you can, all that Drozier did was execute these for you and put them in a sort of a container that made it a little easier, but it didn't really seem worth it at the time. And now that it's been kind of abandoned for several years, it's getting hard to install with the modern versions of the libraries, and it's just not worth the bother anymore. Um, all right, so here's activity manager commands. You can do lots of things, debugging, uh, repeat it a certain number of times, force stop the app, and so on. You know, you can do everything you want with the built-in Android commands, and that's how we're going to do it this semester. It'll just take me a little while to rewrite the projects that used to use Drozer to just execute the commands uh, manually. So skip project M501. Uh, you will find it very hard to do anyway. It's very hard to install Drozer, and it's not worth it. So I'm going to take it off the page. I'm just warning you, and I'm going to replace it with some new project that does the same thing in a more modern way. All right, so here's some examples of these vulnerabilities and attacks. Um, so here was a, here's a phone that's locked. You can't see anything except like emergency call and the date until you put in the PIN to log in. But this attack would simply remove that password protection so the thing would just dump you right on the home page. And it turned out, this was before Android 4.4, there was an intent that would attack the lock screen password type zero that would clear the task. It would just end the lock screen without you typing in a pin. You could just send this intent. Now, of course, you have to have access on the phone, so you can't do this like from the keyboard or anything, but you would do it by having a malicious app on the device send this intent. And it's very easy to trick Android users into installing malicious apps. There's malicious apps in the store and everywhere. So anyway, that was a, a flaw, a lock screen bypass. And then there's tap jacking, and this applies to all phones and to web pages too. It's been known for quite a while. This is a false user interface attack, where what you do, you, if you find some graphic element you can put on top of other elements, and the things they use here are called toasts, little graphic elements. So you have some page, and you have some page here which is installing a new app or agreeing to permissions, and you say, pop the balloons to win a prize. And you think you're popping these balloons, but you're actually clicking on that button. So this is a user interface attack, the viewer only sees this, but their clicks are actually going to this page behind there. And there's a lot of versions of this. All right, they also call it click jacking on web pages. It's been around for years. All right, here's another one that I always wondered about. It's true of iPhones too, when you, when you turn off an app, it shrinks down and minimizes. And that means it's keeping a picture of that screen. And Android also has a page you can usually click a square icon somewhere, and then you'll see all your available pages. You see little shrunk copies of the pages you're reviewing, and those might contain sensitive information, like a password or, or something. So in principle, these little things ought to be treated with uh, some security, but they're just stored in RAM. They're only available to privileged users. So if you can steal them, you might be able to find something out of them. It's a possible vulnerability. And then, on, again, on earlier versions of Android, there was a thing called a fragment. You could run, um, send this activity. This is the Drozer command, but you, you do it with AM now, if you're not using Drozer. And you'd send it with this thing, choose lock password fragment. So you could have a fragment, and that would let you go directly to the change your pin page without entering your existing pin. So you could just change the pin to something you know, and again, you'd bypass the pin lock. So that's another flaw. 
Uh, yes, if you if you could do it with your phone that's connected to a computer and you had Android debugging on, then you could send the intent that way. That's right. Or you could do it if you had a malicious app on the device. Android debugging, you mean you set it in the, uh, in the Android phone? Yes, you'd have to have Android debugging turned on in the Android phone, which is why that's something uh, they don't, don't recommend. And that's why another vulnerability that came by is they sold um, phones that already had debugging turned on, and that's considered a serious security vulnerability. Yeah, yes, and do they still work? Um, well, Ruhani, no, these will only work if you have those really old phones. They'll, they would still work if you had a phone running these really old versions of Android, but like we said, not even 1% of phones have this old version. So these attacks really wouldn't work on, on most people's phones anymore. All right, let's take a look at the Kahoot. And you know, that's the point, that's why you um, report these phones and they get fixed, and so the, uh, the attacks presumably get harder and such. Those ones where they affect the entire Android operating system, those are mistakes made by Google affecting all the phones, and those are rare and Google fixes them. What's far more common is you find mistakes that are um, made by the app developer on just one app. That's common, because the app developers are often, you know, not very skilled, and they're more likely to make mistakes than Google. All right, so 7A is here. That's the same thing true of all operating systems. Like, you don't very often find Microsoft flaws, but you'll often find flaws in things that are running on Windows. Oh, well, yeah, I, I see Zhu is saying, cannot imagine that Google developed the early version for so many huge bugs. Well, everything has that many bugs at first, I think. I remember, I think I was surprised at first, but I got used to it. I think every product has enormous bugs at the start. Windows has had tons of severe bugs, although I think the really big one, it's been 2008 since there was a real, really big one. MSO867, you could just take over every, every machine, although Eternal Blue was pretty bad. Yeah. But I think that was 10 years ago. I think we haven't had a really big one in Windows in 10 years, so I think Microsoft is getting their act together. And like I say, I think Android has also gotten pretty good. Haven't seen any of those uh, really nasty bugs since about Android 5, and we're now up to 11, so that's pretty good. All right, let's give it a try. Oh, they're enforcing limit. Well, I'm gonna have to pay them money. Well, I'm not gonna change it today, but I may actually have to sign up and pay money or something. We'll see what happens. All right. Finally, yeah. <laughs> All right, so how do you send an intent? Okay, uh, yes, Andrew, uh, activity manager, AM is the answer anyway. They handle intents. That's the command built into Android. All right, what components were exported by default in the old Android versions? Okay, those are content providers. All right, what intent filter can match any part of the data?
path. Good. All right. So what intent filter is the part at the start, like HTTPS. That's scheme. Good. All right. All right. I know who that is. I know who that is. Thank you. 